Right, good evening everybody and welcome to episode number 99 of my Jump Game Review Series. I am your host, Chris Gogolin. Thank you very much for being here and joining us on this lovely Monday evening. We are less than a week away from the 2020 Match Play Championship. <coughs> Excuse me. You got to see the brackets revealed this week on Howl Theater with uh, Dan and Matt and, and Bill. We'll talk a little bit about those. We'll look and see if there's any uh, games going on here, though I have a feeling that a majority of these, like this, some of these, are going to be private games as people are starting to you know fine-tune their decks and, and play test things for the MPC, uh, which is this weekend. Uh... So yeah, it may not be too many games for us to jump into, but there's a couple out there. I mean, obviously there's one right here, Profit versus Map. That could be an interesting game. Probably a little uh, one-dimensional. We'll, you know, we'll pull it up. We'll take a quick peek while we're yapping about some other stuff. Let's see what's going on here. All right. So uh, obviously Map, one of the big new cards, uh, or new series of cards shall we say with this emperor thing from set 14 so you get the dead speak which if you have this card which is what you start with map you then it gives you the throne so you get instant access to get a 2-0 while the emperor's on that planet attrition against your opponent is plus two at same location as kylo pride or ray kylo your best guy, Pride, a pretty strong character, or Ray, a very versatile light side character. So you're getting plus two attrition. You get to start the effect, which pulls the sight. The sight, once per game, pulls the Emperor. Uh, no four strains are allowed there, so even if they take it over, they can't drain there. Uh, light side icons are canceled here, so you can never make it a battleground. Uh, and light side characters are deploy plus two there. Uh, the Emperor himself never deploys or moves to a location with an icon, but he does let you draw the bottom card of your force pile, the same thing that Ray does. And once per game, if he's about to be lost, you can just take him back into hand. Also seems pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> it's also a pretty big activation jump uh, with map, as we're looking at here. Joker King wisely points out, uh, in the chat here, uh, we are, you know, dark sides, the end of their second turn, and they're going to be activating 21 force. Now, granted, their opponent did give them four. That's a lot for light side icons, too, uh, or a fairly large amount, uh, four. Usually you get like one or two from your opponent uh, at this early stage of the game on your opponent's first turn, basically. So, but yeah, I mean, map... You start this and these, so you get two, four, five, plus one for you is six to start. You use the dead speak to get the 2-0, the 2-0 to get the emperor. So now you just gave yourself three extra icons, putting you up to nine. Starkiller base pulls this. You deploy a guy here and pull Jakku. Uh, so that's 11, 12, 13 that you've just given yourself by the end of your first turn. This is the one that, if Emperor on table, you can go get the system. Um, some people use other stuff. I've seen Kuat also be used in place of this because this doesn't do a whole lot for you. Uh, it makes the Troopers forfeit plus one. Or you can put any three cards from your Lost Pile out of play to deploy a non-unique Trooper from the Lost Pile. So it gets you know, your non-unique guys back. Not overly the greatest thing in the world. Um, so I have seen people, instead of you know using this to get the system, and then maybe you put cards out of play to get a trooper back, it's like, you know, maybe we'll just play like Kuat or something, which can let me pull either of these systems, um, and then any of my other ships, other than like the finalizers, like if I'm running the Chimera and Thrawn or something, um, you know, you can do some stuff like that. Uh, and then, yeah, then you get your other site out as well. Um, it's all pullable. It's all big pull chains from the deck. You get a huge force activation bump. 
Um, the downside, of course, is map is fairly restrictive on the character pool that it has to work with. So you just put one, two, three, four, five battlegrounds on the table that are all two ones. And none of them say drain minus one, to the best of my knowledge. Nope. You just put five two one locations that have no drain reduction on any of them. So if you happen to be playing against the light side deck, that can sprawl um, or take over your opponent's sights and kind of just, you know, take the fight to them. They've really uh, hamstringed themselves and hinder themselves. You know, force icons are a double-edged sword, right? We've, we, we always say that. That's an interesting thing for, of course, Joker King also points out for match play uh, coming up here for the MPC, the ability to put cards out of play to lower your loss pile count. Uh, now, this is sort of a cost. I think it's all related. So you have to have at least like a trooper in there. But yeah, I mean, late game, you could just keep, you know, put three cards out of play, deploy a trooper, battle, forfeit the trooper and next turn, just keep doing the same thing uh, just to keep putting your loss pile out of play so you have no loss pile just to give yourself a tiebreaker advantage. Um, you know, obviously you'd rather just win the game uh, or win the game by enough, but, uh, you know, anytime you get into a, a, a tie situation, having an advantage on that tiebreaker can certainly come in handy. Let's go big screen on this. All right, so map... We talked about them and everything. They're starting. We've already got a finalizer with PV and Hux parked at Jakku. I guess that's how he spent turn two. You know, turn one was Emperor, yada, yada, pull all your stuff. Uh, and obviously, you don't have to spend force for it, which is kind of the advantage of uh, this effect as well, whereas Kuat would cost you two. Um, and if you're not playing other Star Destroyers, there's no benefit to that. Uh, finalizer Hux there. For nine, ten, uh, yeah, ten. And then PV's also minus one aboard that, so twelve, which you gave yourself thirteen. We counted, so if you pulled everything right, so now you're set up strong here. Oh, let's look at our map objective. Resistance agent is Luke. Okay, so Luke's down. Got some use pile pulls. We got EPP Leia, Chewy Protector. We got Kylo with a lightsaber. Kylo came from hand, though, so he deployed the shuttle. Didn't pull Kylo from deck. He deployed Kylo from hand outside. Always running the risk when your opponent has force left that Kylo's going to get barriered and stuck inside the shuttle, which would be bad. Uh, so I guess he opted to not risk it and just deploy Kylo outside. Excuse me. And we got another trooper down, so there's trooper number two. And now he'll be able to use all his extra force and draw some cards. Uh... Profit, on the other hand, started the typical Profit stuff that we see. I must be allowed to speak. Wackling uh, and Seeking. Seeking Virtual here. Occasionally we've seen like Jedi business uh, variations on this deck to let you use, take advantage of Qui-Gon and Mace Windu and some of those stronger Jedi characters, um, especially with the city outskirts that can pull a Jedi once per game. Uh, but you also have the benefits of doing that with Luke and Ben Kenobi and that kind of stuff as well. Um, we've seen the General Kenobi, General Leia versions of Profit. Um, I've seen Saitor be the third effect over Wackling, so you can get your weapons and, uh, you know, give Leia a blaster, give Luke a lightsaber, that kind of stuff. Give Han a gun. 
then you can use a blaster pings off that kind of stuff with a good blaster at your side. Um, so, you know, you get blaster ping, a profit ping, four strains, BB-8 ping, kind of like that death by a thousand paper cuts. Yes, Luke was the agent, if you didn't see that earlier. So he's got to lose two. No Imp Decree. Imp Decree, not as popular of a card, which is why some people seem to be pushing the, the profit, the WAP uh, agenda. Because Imp Decree doesn't have a lot of targets anymore, so it's, it's a little bit more of a situational card slot. Okay, we got our first sense. Uh, so Heisenberg did pull the Do or Do Not Shield, which you kind of feel like is an auto play because any deck that like gets the Emperor out turn one, bring him before me, Emperor. It's like, yeah, why wouldn't you play sense in a deck like that, right? I mean, you've got a couple of sevens in there with you know Image and possibly uh, the Lieutenant Dofeld. Um, If Hux is out, he's plus one, so he becomes a seven. So you could have, you know, a couple of sevens floating around there in the deck. All right, so he successfully senses the I think I can handle myself, loses the sense and two cards to stop a drain plus one. Probably not the best way to use a sense. Um, just from a, I mean, obviously, yes, you're taking a card away from your opponent, a card that he could use uh, multiple other times throughout the game. But here at this point in the game, instead of losing one force to a four strain, an extra one force, you just lost three cards. So you just hurt yourself for two extra cards. And now we've got the new Ray, who can also get pulled by the city outskirts. Once during your control phase, search your lost pile, choose two cards. Opponent places one out of play, and you get to retrieve the other. And then once per game, whoops, I think he just screwed that. Yeah, he's going to go back and get that. Uh, once per game, may download a lightsaber on Ray. She's immune to less than five. So I guess if you don't need to run Cytor because you're just going to pull... You can Ray pulls her own lightsaber, and then you know you've got uh, some use pile pulls off of. I must be allowed to speak for Luke, Leia, Chewie, and Lando. Uh, you can see getting away from playing uh, a Cytor in that case. Okay. So he's going to pull the Don't Do That Again shield. It's a good popular counter strategy against scum decks. Don't do that again. Use that to pull uh, a gift. 3PO moves into the, or R2, or any other droid, BB-8, any other droid you've got. Moves into the audience chamber. You play a gift. Now wherever they have aliens, their four strains are minus one, and their battle destiny draws are each minus two. And scum decks don't usually have the best destiny. They've gotten up there quite a bit with some of the new virtual cards that have come out the last couple sets. Um, but they're also drawing multiple destinies. So if you're drawing two or three destinies, instead of being like, hey, I drew four, four, five, it's like, no, you drew two, three, three. Um, that can obviously make a big difference in power and the number of characters that have to get forfeited, especially in space. I find that dark side scum decks seem to add some destinies in space with. Uh, you know, whether it's Boba Fett, whether it's uh, Guri on the Stinger, or uh, Proxima, or any of that kind of stuff. So, Maul does pull Weapon of the Sith. To stop the weapon live. And Heisenberg is going to try and pull an immediate effect. He does find the gift. Also gives him the ability to now peek at his deck to find out what's in his reserve deck still. 
if he has the weapon for Ray or something like that. There is the weapon lev. He's going to play it used to get the weapon out of the used pile. Not risk trying to draw. So the shield here makes you have to basically draw a destiny plus one greater than ability. So you'd have to draw five to steal Kylo's lightsaber. If he's looking at what's in there, there's not a lot of fives. Not really going to play it offensively instead. Uh, so he verifies. He goes for the weapon. It's not there, which means that any weapons that he has still in his deck are either are floating around in the force pile still. And now he's going to move 3PO over. He'll play the gift. I mean, it makes 3PO an undercover spy, which does help him block uh, a drain. So on the move phase, you know, 3PO can move back over to where Kylo is and kind of, you know, box that out there. Luke's going to move away. We'll see if Ray moves over as well. Probably. I think he was hoping to have a little bit more to work with to possibly challenge that. Uh, so that's... He does have three battlegrounds now, though, so he can also pull Ultimatum. Oh, he's going to move Leia over. Is he going to move it? Yeah, he wouldn't move everybody over. He would have left Ray there if he was going to do that. Instead, he's just going to move Leia in front. And then you're going to start to wonder about what counter cards does he really have, if this is how he's spreading out. Does he have uh, It's a Trap or something to cancel the, f the battle? Uh, does he have something that allows him to react. Does he have Fallen Portal because he's now at Java's Palace and he's trying to entice his opponent to battle him so he can, you know, pick somebody off? Does he have a Sorry About the Mess combo or a Blast Emergency so he can pump Leia's up and then hit somebody, hit Kylo? Does he just have a dodge? And he's just going to move Leia away. He's just going to block a drain of three for a turn. And hope that his dodge goes through and doesn't get sensed. In the meantime, he's going to lose two to the drain at Jakku, though. This is the part that I never understood. Why is this guy still here? You activate a bajillion force. You drew some cards. You had plenty of force left. Corn Horn, Jin Urso, Cassian, Jar Jar. There's like four people off the top of my head, and there's plenty of others. Art, you know, not R2, but uh, there's plenty of other guys that are spies that could just drop right here and beat the crap out of this guy, whether you know you have a gick or don't have a gick. Move this guy out of here. Put him up here as a passenger and just have a couple extra forfeit fodder. Because all you're doing is just begging somebody to, to make you show the gick. And if they happen to have something like draw their fire or whatnot, you're shield busted now. God forbid they're playing a frozen assets uh, and just lock you out. And you're like, oh, I lose because uh, you played frozen assets. It's like, no, it's not because I played frozen assets and draw their fire. It's because I left a guy here alone who serves no purpose by being there. So that's my monologue on that. Oh, another new card, the Steadfast. While alone at a battleground, adds force icons to equalize them for both sides here. Permanent pilot of ability 2. It's immune to less than 4. 
So it adds, while he's at a battleground, he equalizes the icons, so this becomes a 2-2 system now. And we've got Allegiant General Pride now, who adds a Destiny one with a Resistance character. While Emperor on the table, he also adds to Attrition at this location for other First Order characters. So he's already triggering a plus two off the Dead Speak, plus his own text can also trigger up to three, so he basically is adding a plus, he could be adding up to as much as five attrition, and possibly a battle destiny. It's a little ridiculous. And there's the dodge. Now let's see if this gets sensed. It's also a react, so a gick combo could cancel it. And there is said gick combo which is now going to get grabbed. So we'll see how this plays out. If Heisenberg has the Hujix, this guy who's stuck here now, who doesn't have any force left to move, is probably going to be the game-ending beatdown that Heisenberg needs to win this matchup. You're not allowed to play frozen assets in profit. You may not deploy frozen assets. There you go. Okay, so you can't play it in profit. But in this case, you don't need to. Other decks, obviously, frozen assets draw their fire is the thing. Uh, but obviously, in this deck, you can't play it. Thank you for the correction there. I haven't played profit in a little while. But hey, you don't need to now, because guess what? He didn't leave any force. And he also played a gick, which you grabbed. So now he needs plenty of force. You don't even need to draw their fire anymore. So he blocks it with the dodge. He cancels the dodge with the gift, with the the gick combo, and then Heisenberg plays. It's a trap to cancel the battle anyway because he saved a whole bunch of force. Then in his opponent's turn, he moves three PO over to block the drain. Prophet says, each battleground location occupied by Han, Luke, Leia, Chewie, Orlando. So he's going to cause one, two, three ping damage. He's going to use three force. He's going to get lightsaber proficiency. With Walkling. Does it? Yeah, it does say while well this side up. So, yeah, you could once you flip. Uh, you know, it's a thing. Jawas. Yeah, ja you could use Jawas too, I guess, if you wanted to. Uh, don't tell Kendall, but yeah, you could use Jawas. But uh, yeah, you know, what do you got? You got Corn Horn and like EPP Qui-Gon with lightsaber proficiency. It's like power 10, 11 to 2, hit, forfeit 0, draw destiny, and it's like, hey, peel 12 cards. In a game, you're miles ahead on a board position. Yeah, not miles ahead, but you're well ahead on board position. And it's like, how am I going to lose this game? By leaving this guy here by himself where he serves no purpose once he pulled the Jakku system. As soon as you deployed this ship, shuttle his ass up. There's your free lesson for the NPC or any other tournament that you're playing in. Don't leave characters alone, especially where they don't do anything while they're there alone. The Emperor over here does stuff while he's alone. Gives you a nutrition bonus, has cool game text, draws destiny by himself. Okay, so Ray opted to have... He chose dodge and it's a trap. His opponent put dodge out of play and allows Heisenberg to retrieve the It's a Trap. And he will pull a fifth shield, so I guess he used Cold Feet earlier that we missed, and he'll get the Resistance Shield. Oh, 
All right, here's the three ping damage. Maul's going to lose a Imperial Command. There's Mataka and a Pride as well. Paying three to drain, so I guess he doesn't have the spy. That's a shame. This would be the golden opportunity. I would end this game right here. Heisenberg definitely has a life force advantage. Ten in hand plus twenty nine down is thirty nine to twenty one. So he certainly does have a life force advantage. Uh, he is paying for all of his drains, but now he just puffed up Ray with a lightsaber and a proficiency, which is going to get altered. All right, that's clever. <clears throat> this is our new set 14 altar, by the way. Immune to opponent's objective and does not cause you to lose force to do or do not. So you don't lose any force for it. You just, it's just lost. Immune to the objective, meaning things like uh, mine, which you have learned in Hunt Down, that add to the, to the total. It's to your opponent's, though, so you can't play it in your own Hunt Down deck. Or vice versa. We got Owen and Baru to the farm. We got Yaxjit over here. I uh, don't know we've got any weapons right now to, to retrieve. He can do that, though. Should you lose any weapons. We got a free Owen and Baru. That always smells like harvest. It's not a card that people play very often, but uh, Owen and Baru deploying for free to the Lars Moisture Farm, and it's like, Go get any four cards you want out of your lost pile. Leia runs away now. No need for her to stay there. Three PO's there blocking the drains. So if you're looking at overall damage, uh, you've got drains of two and two going on here. This is blocked unless there's some type of uh, sniper or something that's going to get rid of three PO. And uh, on the other side of things, you've got three ping damage and then one big drain of two. So doing five damage light side, four damage dark side, and light side's ahead on life force count. So right now light side actually doesn't need to do anything. Um, <coughs> and it's going to be dark side who's going to have to push the pace. The other problem earlier with deploying the shuttle, when you didn't use it to pull Kylo, uh, now the shuttle has kind of got you landlocked into this, because now you've got to leave stuff here to defend it. This thing can't just, like, take off. Uh, like when you put it over here or here, you know, the shuttle then just takes off and it, you know, docks on the finalizer or whatever. Um, you're kind of stuck there with the, the shuttle at the site. A saber user and a clash, yes. That would also be pretty brutal. Clash Kylo and beat up on, you know, the shuttle and these guys. Uh, a lightsaber and a sorry about the mess to pick off somebody. Yeah. Uh, those are always the little tricks that map has been vulnerable to. Because of their lower ability characters. They don't have a lot of guys who do things by themselves. You know, Kylo and Snoke are ability high enough to do stuff. Almost everybody else, you know, nobody has a draw of an able to otherwise text. A couple people add destinies and things, like Phasma with a guy or uh, Pride with a resistance character.
We saw him draw for Destiny earlier. There's obviously an Ellis floating around. Jagtech points out in the chat, amusingly, I also learned that when you clash a hit emperor, he can't use his text to return to hand because he's inactive when he's clashed. So you hit the emperor in this scenario, in a battle, then you play clash to exclude him. He becomes inactive when he's excluded from the battle, so his game text doesn't count. Uh, and then because he's removed from the battle by the rules, he has to be lost. So because his game text is inactive, the part that says you can take him back into hand... Uh, isn't seen and doesn't allow you to do that then. And if you're light side, I'm sure that'd be very amusing. If you're dark side, probably not laughing too much, but... Heisenberg does pull a Grimtosh. Maybe a little later than he would want for that, but certainly does give him the option to see what's in his opponent's hand. Is going to play a cold feet here. Maybe he's just thinking. Maybe he's just stalling for time. And he just picks any old shield. Still in the activate phase here, so he does still have seven force left. So we got drains a two and two. He throws away the rendezvous point. Top decks rose from the used pile. There goes the Grimtosh. Not much point to that at right now. And there goes the escape pod combo as well. He's just going to move Kylo over. Oh, looks like he's going to change his mind. <coughs> So we did a revert. Excuse me again. So he did a revert and then moved Kylo onto the shuttle. And then takes Kylo back off the shuttle. Uh, I'm not sure where Kylo was going with the shuttle. Probably a misclick. Maybe he's playing on a tablet or something small. So Kylo is going to move over. I 
Eisenberg is going to move 3PO over to block the Kylo Saber drain. We're going to see light side move, dark side move the rest of their guys over, I guess, at this point. And leave the shuttle kind of hanging out to dry by itself. That power to zero, <laughs> low forfeit five shuttle against the guy with 10 cards in his hand. By moving 3PO over, he gives himself the option to just run away. There's not... Heisenberg doesn't actually have, at this point, to dictate, uh, to force any actions. You know, just by doing the three ping damage every turn with the objective. Uh, you know, the map deck has put quite a few cards on the table already. He's already got a decent number of cards in his loss pile. Uh, so that three ping damage a turn, plus the drain of two from from Ray and Leia there. Um, you know, it's five damage a turn. You could just activate, pay to drain, move away, and keep making uh, Maul here chase him around Tatooine while draining for four in space. Light side's already ahead if they're getting the extra, you know, five. They're doing five damage to four damage, and they're already ahead on cards. Well, common core math will tell you that, I don't know what it will tell you actually, um, but regular real math will tell you that you're going to lose. Did he forget it has a permanent pilot? I don't know. Like if the shuttle was totally empty, then yeah. Right, if there's nobody on the shuttle, but yeah, the shuttle does have a permanent pilot. Uh, and kick is grabbed, so if he does have a second kick, it would cost him to stack it because that's what this little thing says player must first stack it here and use plus one force for each interrupt in stack so the second one would cost you two and he only saved one maybe he's got a barrier well we know uh, Heisenberg has Han's gun question is, is what other characters might he have? It's too big of a risk to battle in this situation. I'll be honest. It's way too big of a risk. Because Profit doesn't do any damage on the zero side. You cause no ping damage and you can't force drain on Tatooine. So, uh, in a game like this, giving your opponent one or two free turns while Han dies and then you know you have to retrieve him with Seeking and then redeploy him and then flip your objective again to then start doing damage the following turn. Uh, it does give your opponent, you know, a chance to catch their breath a little bit, so... And you're probably better off in a situation like this just moving, you know, obviously if you have guys you can deploy and battle the shuttle and cause some overflow, that's great. Uh, if you have guys who can go off planet and spread him out further, he's only got four cards in hand and 12 cards left down here, and he's still losing. Um, so, I mean, if you had Lando or Cornhorn or Jin or Yoda or Qui Gon, not Ben Kenobi, but a different version of Obi Wan. <coughs> Uh, you can certainly spread things out a little bit. So, uh, this Ray's game text is fairly good here too. It's, you know, it's not it's a once per turn kind of thing. So it's once per turn and retrieve a card, and put a card out of play, which in a match play scenario helps your loss piles we talked about earlier. So, So proficiency goes out of play, 
and the I think I can handle myself gets retrieved. Now we've got a rose coming down to retrieve more cards. Hey, there's that EPP Qui-Gon. Not quite as effective, you know. But uh, should still do the trick. Han gets his gun. His gun's pretty cool. I like his gun. Deploys on Beckett or non-spy Han. Target a character. Target hit. Forfeit zero. Destiny plus two. Greater than defense value. And if it's on Han, you can fire once during your control phase. So it has a built-in sorry about the mess function to it. You can also place this weapon in use pile to cancel a weapon destiny targeting him. That we're going to talk about for a second. Ouch, that's 12 to 0. That's the shuttle and seven cards. Uh, and without a second kick, that should be game over, most likely. Um, but anywho, so in profit, you have to be careful with this because while armed with the blaster, Han is defense value plus two. So Han becomes defense value five. If you throw the gun in the use pile to cancel the weapon destiny targeting him, it lowers his defense value back to three because he's no longer armed with the blaster. So, like, they swing at him with the lightsaber, and that first destiny, like, they draw a four. And you're like, okay, well, he's not hit yet. And then they draw another four. And you're like, oh, crap, he's hit now because it's an eight. I'm going to throw the gun to the use pile to lower, you know, to cancel that second four. Okay, but now you've just lowered your defense value to three, so you're still hit. Um, just something to keep in mind. Obviously, putting the gun in your use pile is advantageous because it gets you a card back and you know when you redeploy Han and get him out later again you can try and put the gun back on him so it probably still works out in your benefit like that but you know make sure you think that through and actually want to do that before you go any further so so he didn't have anything cool he peeled seven cards a barrier a laser cannon barrier battery a marriage aid a point man a sense all off the reserve deck Mataka and Command, so he peeled seven. And now Heisenberg can freely just move away and win the game in two turns. <coughs> and he's just going to go ahead and scoop it. So congrats to Heisenberg on the win. And uh, Maul, if you watch this video later, hopefully you pick up at least one or two things. Like, get this guy the hell out of here. <laughs> So, uh, thanks for giving us something to stream, though, guys. Appreciate you uh, playing the games. All right, we'll take a little sec segue here. Let's talk about the MPC. So, the bracket's up. They went over it last week. Uh, we'll go through it a little bit. This is a big thing I want to remind everybody of. Of course, your deck lists are due by 4 a.m. on Friday. Not Saturday, the day that everybody starts playing. Your deck lists are due at 4 a.m. on Friday, the day before. So they have time to uh, compile all of the deck lists into the various algorithms that they need to so they can set up and run deck checks uh, throughout the event to compare them and the list you're playing against the, the file you submitted. Uh, so they do that. They need that a day in advance to get all that coordinated. <coughs> Sorry, I can't shake this thing. So basically, before you go to bed Thursday night, make sure you submit your deck lists. Uh, you also have to play that those two lists for the entire, however many rounds you make it through that weekend. Those are the decks you're playing Saturday and Sunday. Can't change decks till the following weekend. 
There's a prediction contest for the bracket where you can predict some winners. You just click this little button here that says prediction leaderboard. We'll open it up. Oh, it's going to make me log in. Hang on. There we go. Oh, data breach. Got to change some passwords. Okay, good to know. All right, so we got a handful of people who have already made their predictions. Joe Olson, Joe Olson, Joe Olson, Joe Olson. Yeah, he seems to be a popular pick, and I can understand why. He's won this event before. A lot of Joe Olsons. Some people still finishing up there. Predictions. Yep, you still have time to get yours in. Uh, this is probably due by Saturday morning before the first games kick off. So go ahead and get your predictions in. Fill out your fun bracket. And uh, see how good of a guesser you are. All right, so since Joe Olson is predicted to win by most people, let's take a look at his bracket here and see what we got. So Joe's got a buy, so don't pick Joe to lose the first round. Um, and we got Sam and Paul. That's a pretty evenly even match there. They're both good players. They both have had, uh, you know, strong records uh, in months of the OCS and things like that. Uh, and they've both been fairly active. Not like either of them has really had a, a long time off. I, Sam being a teammate of mine, I would expect him to win that match or, or hope for him to win that match. But, uh, you know, uh, Paul's a good guy. I really enjoyed our conversations at Euro Worlds uh, back in Germany a year and a half ago. So, uh, you know, good luck to them both. Uh, you got your Gem PC winner, Joker King, against David Dredge. Bill Kafer, Steven Squirrelock, possibly being a Bill Kafer, Chris Hull matchup here in round two, which should be for some some good games there. Uh, Joe versus either of these guys, you know, you'd, you'd favor Joe being the, the the champ that he is, but uh, you know, Joe is probably thinking further ahead. Joe's looking at who else is in my bracket. All right, I possibly have Charlie and Jared down here, so you know, you you hope uh, nobody over gets overlooked. But there's always that possibility that, you know, one of these guys is like, I know what I'm going to beat Joe with. And if, as long as they win their first round and get to do it, you never know what could happen in these types of, of games. Uh, Pat and Jeremy, again, two evenly matched players. Don't really look at the seeding here so much. There's a big clump of guys, uh, you know, like four through seven are kind of all clumped up together really well and could have gone a variety of different directions. Uh, but the teammates aspect of it and the different time zones, because we were playing 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. games. So they're just kind of splitting people up into two different groups there. So the time zones had also a bit of a factor to uh, kind of flip things around a little bit, move things around. So yeah, so you're like four through six, four through seven, all pretty interchangeable. Like your seven through ten guys are all kind of clumped up. Seven through eleven guys, some of those guys are all pretty evenly matched skill-wise as well. Uh, and then your twelves and thirteens again, also all interchangeable. So uh, Pat and Jeremy, uh, you know, two guys that don't play online a lot. I mean, Rambo's plays online a lot, but he hasn't, he hasn't played a lot of live events. Uh, you know, Pat plays in some live events. I think he's made the final four of an MPC consolation bracket, maybe even have won a consolation event at an MPC. Uh, then you got Charlie down here waiting on the winner of that game. Charlie's had some success, made a couple top eights. Uh, Mike Turner, Vikram, Vikram not playing very actively. Mike Turner probably likely to win this matchup uh, just because he's more active and has played more often. You know, just activity-wise, you feel pretty good about that. Uh, and then they'll move on to face Jared. Jared made the final four last year uh, of this tournament. Does he have another Cinderella run in him? Or, uh, you know, now that he's a higher seed, uh, do those great expectations kind of weigh him down. Uh, it's it's a hard tournament to make a run to the Final Four in, and uh, it's even harder to do it in consecutive years. So, Pat won something last year. He won the Constellation last year. Okay, well, there you go. 
See, I knew the name sounded familiar for a reason with Constellation events. So yeah, uh, most people obviously in the prediction contest are thinking Joe's going to pull out of this bracket, but it wouldn't surprise me at all to see, you know, the winner of this Joker King Bill matchup get to the top eight uh, and get out of the, or final four come out of this bracket, uh, possibly upset Joe, uh, or get to the top eight. We'll say upset Joe and get to the top eight and face off against the bottom half of the bracket. Uh, would not would not surprise me. Um, too much, a little bit. Anytime, you know, a number one seed loses, there's always a little bit of surprise. Um, but it's certainly possible. These guys are both great players, and, uh, you know, obviously things can happen along the way. And then the bottom half of the bracket, uh, you know, Mike could pull off an upset over Jared. Either of these guys could pull off an upset over Charlie. So kind of a wide open bottom half, but. You know, if you're if you're betting against if you're going against the seeding and you're like, you know, who could be a surprise to come out of this? Uh, I could see like a Charlie Chris Hull kind of three four matchup for the top eight as a possibility. Maybe this is Mike Turner's year. Maybe this year he breaks through and just makes a run at it. I don't know. Some interesting stuff going on here. Our second bracket over here, the Chris Kelly bracket, overseeded, uh, over design advocate. But no, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, he won the event the last time we played it in person. Uh, so congrats to Chris. He also has a U.S. National Championship under his belt as well. But he's got the unenviable task of, of waiting for the winner of the Scotland Grill Rich Craft matchup. Uh, Scott Knott is known for playing very un unorthodox, unconventional decks. So then you start putting yourself on, well, what you know, what could Scott uh, be running with there? Oh, wasn't paying attention. Uh, and if you start thinking too far about that, you know, making sure you get past Scott, well, what if Scott doesn't win? And now you've opened yourself up to not having the cards you need to beat Rich. Or, great, you won, you got your buy, and then you beat Scott. And now you're sitting here waiting on Timo or Matt Lutz, two guys, you know, who also were in the final four of the Gem PC uh, and could easily come out of the top half of this bracket. So, again, you know, lots of interesting matchups and, and things that could sort of play out in here. Uh, you look at the bottom half of the bracket, you got, you know, Shaw and Wirfs. Uh, two strong players. Wirfs has made a couple of top eights in the last couple of years, a, a couple of top uh, final four at Nationals two years ago, where I think he lost to Greg uh, in Minnesota in that final four. So could set up a rematch of that. Uh, Matt Scott made a, a deep run to the top eight last year, I think, in the MPC. I think that's right. I think Matt and I played in the top 16, and he squeezed by me by one card and made it to the next round where I think he lost to Jared by like one or two cards um, to, for Jared to advance to the, to the final four. That sounds familiar. Uh, but you got Justin Mayashiro, who's, you know, who's always been in that conversation of, of, you know, the next breakout star or just a guy who's always kind of hovering around the top eight, you know, who's kind of put up some five and threes at some big events and, you know, just kind of that one win shy of getting over that hump uh, could certainly be his year. Taking on a uh, returning Minnesota guy, Garrett Larson. Garrett, one of the former advocates from way back in the day. Kind of coming back to the game. He's been a moderator on the forums for years, but hasn't really actively played much. Same thing with Zach Stenerson here. Another guy who was very active, kind of took, didn't really play for a number of years, uh, and then kind of pops up every time there's like, every time we do something in Minnesota is, is when Zach usually pops up. But now he's starting to play a little bit more online. Um, and we've seen him in a couple of online majors event uh, in the COVID era. But, uh, you know, shh. I would not put my money on Chris Kelly making the final four out of this bracket. Between the Timo Matt Lutz possibility, between, you know, dodging this bullet and then this bullet, 
and then the Shaw Wirfs bullet as well. Uh, you know, Chris, great player. Certainly capable of it. If you're taking Chris Kelly against the field in that bracket, I'm taking the field. All right, let's take a peek at the bottom half of the bracket. MHT, great player, plethora of Final Four appearances, one of the most consistent players uh, in the Star Wars CCG universe from like 08 to like 2013, 2014. Uh, was consistently in the Final Four of like every tournament he played in during that time period, or at least the top eight. Uh, of all the tournaments he, he appeared in during that period. Uh, and then, you know, moved to Australia to work on his master's, PhD, one of those things. Um, so kind of fell out of the live event tournament circuit. But, uh, you know, has been playing on Gemp off and on for a little while in terms of the OCS and some other events and things, and now with us still running majors online, uh, Matt's made a pretty good dent in the competition in uh, the last couple of events. Edward Sheehan, Sean Dixon. Edward, a guy who plays quite a bit online. Sean, a Pittsburgh guy, typically only plays live events in person. Hasn't played all that much online uh, recently. He was for a little while, but kind of haven't really seen him around in any of the OCS or any of the other events. Really? So you move on down to the bottom half. You got Drew and Nick, both guys who've made the OCS top 16s uh, over the last couple of years. They seem like pretty strong favorites to move on here in advance to set up a potential matchup with Matt. Um, they both have solid chances of moving on. I like Drew's chances against Matt a little better than Nick's just because of their style of play. Uh, Matt plays a lot of control decks. Nick plays a lot of control decks. And I think Matt is just a little bit better of a manipulator in terms of board control mitigation stuff than, than Nick is. Um, so I think that would favor Matt slightly in a matchup against Nick. Uh, closer to a coin toss against Drew because Drew's got a little bit, uh, a little more flexibility, I think, in some of the deck types that he usually chooses to play. Bottom half of the bracket, you've got the wild card, David Woods, the guy that uh, Brian Fred fears, apparently. Uh, taking on the bring him before me Canadian Pierre. And then Trunzo after that. The bottom half here, you've got Jared. Uh, Jason and Bob. This should be a good game between these guys. It's maybe one of the games I potentially end up streaming. I don't know. I might. I was going to try and do some streaming at this 10 a.m. matchup time slot, uh, depending on if I'm allowed, because I'm playing in the event, and there's some discussion going on about whether people can't stream until after you've been eliminated or not. Uh, I haven't followed the rest of that thread going on in the tournament committee chat today, so I don't know if a decision was made or not yet. But... Eh. There was a discussion about that as to whether or not people should be streaming as long as you're not streaming while you're playing or not streaming or not watching the stream while you're playing, which is kind of how we did it previously. But then there was also some discussion about whether you just shouldn't stream at all until after you're eliminated from the tournament, especially with the field of only being 52 this year and a number of people sitting out. Are there enough streamers to go around for those early morning games that uh, we can afford to hold off on that? So that may be an option as well. But this would be a game that I think would be pretty good to stream. These are two pretty evenly matched players. And uh, usually play some slightly uh, interesting, colorful decks. So whoever ends up streaming, this might be a pretty good game to stream. Uh, Trunzo, Jared, potentially could be a, a, you know, a very solid matchup there. Uh, I think they may have played two years ago in the Gem PC, possibly. That sounds vaguely familiar. Maybe they were both in the final four of that event, but maybe didn't play each other. I'm trying to remember, it's been a while. Uh, but Jared obviously also has had some good success lately, earning him a number two seed. 
but if you're talking about MHT against the field in this bracket, I think I'm going MHT. Well, I know I'm going MHT because I'm one of the only people who picked him to win the tournament. Everyone's picking Joe to win. I took MHT. That's just my prediction. I could be wrong. Um, yeah, again, lots of great players in every bracket. The top five or six guys in every bracket are certainly capable of making it to the Final Four. We saw that last year with like three six seeds in the Final Four. It was like three six seeds and Hayes uh, were the Final Four. And our last bracket over here, the bottom left corner with Brian Fred uh, waiting on the Karuli Beatty winner. Uh, this should be a very solid game here. You've got Justin Karuli, who a couple years ago uh, was a playoff game away from making the top eight of Worlds. I think he lost. He was 6-2, and two, um, but was ranked like ninth or 10th, and I think he lost his play-in game to get into the top eight. Uh, and Brandon's had some, some solid success, a lot of 5-3 and three kind of, of – of, performances um, probably slightly favored Justin in that matchup you got Brad and you got Ryan Ryan was a little tougher to see this year because Ryan hasn't played a whole lot I mean Ryan's a great player um, he won the team tournament with his wife at the uh, Andor Grand Prix last year in our last live event that we held and certainly does play some creative and off-the-wall decks. Ryan could certainly make a run through the bottom half of this bracket. Brad plays pretty solid decks and has been a consistent player for you know quite some time in the OCS and things like that. Always putting up you know 9 and 3s, 10 and 2s uh, each month. Uh, I think he's qualified for the top 16 uh, at least once. So Brian, so B. Fred certainly has his work cut out for him. And, uh, you know, Fred already qualified for the OCS this year, so he didn't play too much last month, but uh, you know, put up 11 and one the first month. So you'd have to think Brian's in a pretty good spot to at least make it to the top eight out of his bracket. But again, there's landmines in every, in everybody's path. And we get to the bottom half, this little bottom corner of the bracket down here. You got Tom Kelly, who's won this event twice, according to the announcements. I wasn't sure if it was once or twice, uh, but Tom has won it twice and made the finals. Uh, against Chris Kelly. Waiting on the winner of James Martin and Kendall Hallman. James slightly favored to win that matchup by Kendall's own admission. He's a bad player who plays bad decks. Not that he, I really think he's really that bad of a player or that his decks are really that bad, but, uh, you know, he always likes to do something, something quirky. And uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, so... Kendall was nice enough to host me on his podcast, which if you haven't listened to it yet, it was a pretty good time. It was an hour. I think we talked like an hour and 45 minutes. There were a couple of times where like his recording cut out. So we had to stop and like redo something. Um, I think it's, so I think it's only like an hour and a half and uh, I'll just, I already posted this and I'll forewarn you. Uh, I didn't realize I was doing it, but apparently I had a, a clicky pen in my hand. And there's a, a couple of points where I'm just doing that, and I didn't realize the audio would pick it up as well as it did, uh, or even subconsciously that I was doing it, and then I kept putting the pen down, and then I would talk for a little while, and then suddenly I would just sort of pick it up and just start clicking it again. Um, sorry. Didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. Um, so, yeah, so Tom certainly seems like he's a, in a good spot to make a run to at least the top eight of his corner of the bracket. Uh, you got Wayne and Casey Johnson. Casey Johnson is Maul, who we were just watching uh, play that game. So Wayne was in the chat here, and Wayne just got a little uh, extra insight while we were streaming that. Uh, and if uh, if Casey leaves himself wide open to a uh, you know a beatdown like he just did with that. Uh, uh, the shuttle or the first order stormtrooper there. I think uh, you know Wayne's chances of advancing are pretty good. Uh, we always joke about Wayne that Wayne usually pulls off the upsets, whether he's like the nine or the ten seed who upsets the higher seed, um, and then makes you know a, a run through at least one or two opponents. Uh, Wayne being a little higher seeded this year, could that throw off you know his mojo? Probably not. I think Wayne's in a good position. Uh, and then possibly could be, well, I'm expecting that he'll be my opponent in game two. 
to look forward to that matchup. Wayne and I have played over the years a number of times, him being from Long Island, me from New Jersey, so uh, we're in the same league. We play together online and usually have some pretty good games. Uh, but yeah, Wayne could certainly make a run right through me and run into Tom Kelly, go right through Tom Kelly and uh, take on B. Fred or uh, Jellison or Kipple, whoever comes out of the top half of this bracket. Could be Cruelly too. You never know. Uh, B. Fred can be fairly predictable sometimes in certain things. If you look back, I mean, he's we all have pet decks, right? So, you know, you just start preparing for Watcher Step Raiders and, uh, you know, hope that uh, that's what he goes with. <laughs> Add six spies to my deck. Got it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. What's that... Uh, What's that effect? Kane Addis? I know it's a dark side card. Uh, is there a light side version of that? Encampment? I don't know. Some, nah, I think those don't work. You have to occupy the site first. I was going to say, just deploy it on the site. Use, use... Yeah, never mind. I'm getting way out of field here. I was like, yeah, use Walkling to pull it and then put it on the site and then you can deploy guys without spies. Uh, doesn't work like that. But uh, Best of luck to all 52 entrants in this year's MPC. A little sad it was only 52. Uh, you know, I would have thought it'd be in online and everything, but uh, we had, you know, a full bracket last year and had a few people who wanted to get in but couldn't, and we were doing last-minute shuffles before posting the bracket to get people into the event. So uh, only having 52 this year, I'll say it, even if nobody else will. I'm disappointed by that. I'm a little disappointed by that. I mean, I'm thankful for all 52 people who signed up to play. Don't get me wrong at all. But, uh, you know... There's a lot of people missing from this year's event that uh, could have filled out some of these slots. So It should be a great time. We'll be doing live streaming all weekend uh, on a variety of channels. We'll have that multi-channel thing going again where you've got two or three games going on at once, which is awesome. Um, all the details about the streaming will all be posted probably in a separate forum here. In the, this, it'll all be on Twitch. Uh, Dan will probably be on the, the main PC page. And then a lot of other people will be on their own individual pages, and there'll be links and stuff uh, all posted right here on the forums. So, all right. So we got some more private games. We got some casual games. Oh, uh oh. Here's Bill's opponent. Let's. There you go, Bill. We'll get you. Uh, Five seconds of, of scouting. He's playing Watto. Look out. Quietly observing. Okay, so he's using quietly observing. I'm going to guess... Oh, it doesn't tell you who he revealed. I'm going to guess he revealed Watto. Yep, he revealed Watto. Is Sebulba the other one? Yep, Sebulba was the other one. Uh... So for those of you unfamiliar with this quietly observing card, you can make two characters in your deck, uh, two aliens from hand or reserve deck, make them assassins and black sun agents. And then when they're black sun agents, you can then use uh, Shizor's bounty. Which lets you... It's basically works like a barrier. They can't battle or for the rest of the turn. Uh, but it's an immediate effect that you can pull with the fanfare shield, so it works very well in Black Sun as a, a good deterrent, plus a couple of copies of Barrier. Um, Watto also runs a couple of copies of Barrier, so having multiple ways to kind of shut people down and do your damage. And Oh, he converted Moss Espa. That's interesting. All right, so he retrieves five, gets back Leia, Old Ben, Rendezvous Point on Tatooine, Projection, and it could be worse. And then Squirrelock plays the Imbalance Kinton Strider combo to make him lose half, which rounds down, I believe it says. Round down, yes. So he loses two force, and he top decks Odin Nestler and Qui-Gon Jinn. So he's got the anti-alien Qui-Gon here.
whether he's really just choosing the best, what he thinks is the best version of Qui-Gon for his deck, or he's really loading up against Scum. Oh, I definitely understand that, Antares. It's, uh, it's a complex game to learn. It's kind of one of the reasons I do the show is to help try and provide little bits of knowledge, little bits of, you know, lines of play and things like that and why certain strategies work better than others and just sort of also help with the fundamental rules of the game that some people also uh, struggle with. And it uh, can definitely be a big time commitment for sure. Even just finding time to play five or six games to test the deck out to be like, you know, what do I need to change? What do I need to adjust? Do I need three Wattos or two Wattos in this deck? Like, how often am I finding him and him dying? And, you know, little things like that that can, you know, take a time commitment. Um, and then finding people to play against. So there's definitely uh, a big aspect to that. And uh, I myself have not put nearly as much time into the game the last couple of years as I once did. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's shown. There have been certain times where it's really shown more than others. Some days I can still, you know, wing it and get by. Uh, other days, yeah, not so much. This year's tournament certainly could be a possibility there. Uh, we got a big battle going on here, though, with the Mara Jade. Uh, Master Luke trying to bounce Mara Jade and draws a five and misses. Would have gotten Aura Sing, but doesn't get Mara. Mara will now take a swing at said Luke. And Luke is going to be hit and forfeit zero. What do we got here? Is this like a Jedi lightsaber? It is a Jedi lightsaber. Going after the Emperor. Draws another Jedi lightsaber. And misses. So he did those. All right. So if he had gone for Aura with the Luke's text, would have bounced her back to hand. And if he had swung at Mara, he would have hit her. But he went for Mara and the Emperor and missed both. Aura is going to shoot at Ray and miss. Han was released. The objective is flipped, so he already did his retrieval, which we saw earlier. Got hit with the ping damage for retrieving for the imbalance combo. Luke is going to die. He's going to Jedi live to get Hera into hand. Draws another Jedi lightsaber. Did you try like four Jedi lightsabers in this deck? Oh, when Dark Side draws Kessel. It's a curious choice. I guess he added an extra system. Now that you can't do now that Mustafar doesn't pull uh, Vader's castle anymore. added an extra system. Interesting. So Luke dies and Aura Singh dies. And that was Light Side's battle, so that did not go all that well. I guess we'll see Ray run away. Nope, he's going to do 3PO with a gift. And now you've got R2, who's got a higher forfeit value, so I guess that's why he chose to leave him around. If at a battleground site with 3PO, may subtract one from each opponent's battle destiny at same and related sites. Did he do this? No, it didn't matter because he drew Kessel. He didn't need to. 
right, right, right. All right, that's probably be our last turn of this game, and then we'll wrap it up, wrap up the show for tonight. I need to get to work on some MPC decks myself here. I only got three days to uh, figure out what I'm going to play, and then uh, what I think the ideal version of said decks are. There's certainly a lot of decks to choose from for each side. They all have certain pros and cons. Uh, we happen to watch two profit games for light side. That's certainly a viable strategy. Uh, you've always got, you know, your mains platform for light side, whether it's uh, Throne Room, Tig, or uh, Hitco. Uh, and then you've got a variety of old allies, Legend, QMC, which are pretty decent. Diplo's pretty decent. You know, none of them jump out as being, like, ridiculously overpowered the way we've seen, like, Hitco was you know, a couple months ago, where it was just like, all right, this is just stupid not to play this deck. Um, I think it's, they're all a little closer together, but they're all very diverse in what they do. Uh, EBO kind of the same way as well. Um, and they also have their, you know, their rock, paper, scissors matchup. Uh, Yavin 4 Ops, you know, another... Uh, Decent deck as well. No idea, of course. Uh, the other one I think I forgot to mention. That's uh, also pretty solid. Um, and then you look at dark side deck options, and there's you know six or seven viable strategies there. You got var certain variations of scum, variations of dark side mains. Whether it's you know court CCT, which is my kind of scum. Like, this isn't really a thing, but court or CCT are both pretty strong. Um, you know, Watto's obviously a fairly strong, more of a mains style deck. Uh, Hunt Down, Hunt Down V, a stunning move, all pretty, pretty solid. Entanglements took a little bit of a hit, but still decent. Rops kind of in the same way, still decent. You could, you know, kind of port an Entanglements deck over to Rops now. Uh, Map probably will be one of the more popular decks in the whole field. It would not surprise me. Um, and then I'm sure you'll see some other, you know, other decks represented as well, like uh, possibly Watto or, or Set Your Course, or maybe you'll see like one or two random people playing a stunning move. You never know. It's not that great of a deck, but it's still, you know, it's decent. I feel like I'm forgetting another. Uh, yeah. I've heard tales of, uh, you know, could be like some uh, Black Sun or, uh, you know, combat readiness decks, CRV decks, whether it's like a Tatooine or uh, like a Hoth Walker occupation kind of thing, or just occupation decks in general. Tatooine occupation. Uh, you know, you could do Tatooine careful pl or combat readiness for like Java's Palace, pull some Java's Palace sites and then just set up occupation or something that way uh, and get some extra damage in whether it's a scum version or a mains version. Shadow Collective. Shadow Collective is an interesting deck. It puts a lot of cards on the table, and I I mean, p some people may still play it because it does a lot of interesting things, and it definitely requires a lot of card reading, whereas if you know what you're doing with the deck well, you can really manipulate it and use it well against your opponent. Uh, there's maybe a, certainly a lot of cards in there that maybe the they may they may be unfamiliar with that uh, you can certainly take advantage of it. I don't know that Shadow Collective is quite a uh, tier one tier like a tier one deck yet. It's probably right in that solid tier two. Um, maybe just needing a little more time to develop a strategy, or possibly just needing uh, a couple of extra cards in like a set 15, set 16 kind of thing to boost it up a little bit. Um, ISP is the other one I forgot. I knew I was forgetting another platform. Uh, that's another solid tier two platform. So, you know, uh, I think you're, you know, you're, you got 52 players in the field. I think you'll probably see, well, I'm going to guess 11. 
uh, different light side and dark side deck types represented on each side. I will guess 11 as the magic number. While we were watching this game, BB-8 and Ray died. And P-59 got lost as well. Did P-59 shoot anybody? Yes, he did. All right, light side's out of characters on the table. They just have Han and Lore Santika. One of your other resistant characters present can make a regular move. These guys all piled up nicely over here. Could possibly be threatening a bigger drain. Hasn't gone to space yet. Three systems in his deck. You'd have to think he's got to be running three or four starships. Prophet not known for playing space. So it's a little surprising that somebody's not down at one of these systems yet. Could also squeeze out an occupation since you've got two battlegrounds. Clearly, Court is the best dark side deck, says Joker King. Well, that's it then. Everybody play Court. Everybody play Court. Court in Throne Room, ready, go. <laughs> court first Profit. It's, a, it's a, a scenario tournament. Every dark side deck has to play the Court objective. Every light side deck has to play the Profit objective. Ready, go. That'd be interesting. But. All right, one more big battle. Let's see what we got. We got Captain Hera, and we got Yoda, Master of the Force. Hera will add a battle destiny because she's with an Imperial. Without any weapons there, your best case scenario is you get rid of Mara, I think. Court vs. Profit Tournament? Yeah, that'd be a fun tournament. We'll talk to Batmouse and we'll set that up. Make it like a weekend sprint event or something. Let's see all kinds of tech and anti-tech and everybody starting... Chal Bacan and pulling the Cloud City Engineer to convert the audience chamber back to your audience chamber so you can then pull your extra aliens and all kinds of shenanigans. Alright, so Hera got hit, forfeit zero. Light side draws a two and a one. It's good enough to get Mara. Part two is probably going to end up dying here. Multiple copies of the client, huh? Another set 14 card. During your control phase, if present at a site and your bounty hunter occupies a battleground, opponent loses one force. So it's just an extra one force ping, and the bounty hunter only has to occupy a battleground. So you could pile this guy up here and then have like bounty hunters in ships or something like Fett and Slave 1 flying around up in space uh, causing one ping damage. It's interesting. Uh, once per game, if you just lost a bounty hunter, you can take into hand a bounty hunter. So if you lose your Boba Fett off your ship, you can go get your other Boba Fett uh, or your Django Fett or whoever else may be. All right, well, this has been a fun show. Episode number 99. We're one week, or we're one show away. Uh, probably won't be next week after playing in the MPC, hopefully, all weekend and doing all kinds of streaming. Um, 
and then having the finals the following weekend. But we're getting closer. I'm going to have to figure out something really special to do uh, for episode 100. I don't want to do like a look back through the years, one of those you know yearbook celebration photo videos. I don't want to do one of those. Um, but we'll have to do something special for episode 100. Maybe we'll do some giveaways. You know, maybe I'll give away a hundred prizes or something. A um, hundred foil V slips. I don't know, but uh, I'm excited to get there. And uh, you know, didn't really think I'd get this far when I started this show four years ago, the three 2018. Yeah, so three-ish years ago, but. Uh, Thank you guys all very much for tuning in tonight. Hope you had a good time. And uh, good luck to everyone playing in the MPC this weekend. And if you're not playing, be sure and check out all the live coverage throughout the weekend. And uh, everybody have a great night. So take care.